Good afternoon. Uh, what I will be doing is uh, reviewing uh, the project called uh, Next Generation Cognitive Networks. Uh, there are several faculty members involved in the list. I won't read it. But the goal of this project is to really try and incorporate and exploit cognition at a more advanced level to optimize wireless networks. You know, there's a lot of discussion, and I think this is a quite a popular theme, uh, how to uh, incorporate more awareness into wireless networks. And so all of us have different views on how to do this, and I think I will try and, and describe a different uh, work that is going on in the center trying to address this, uh, this bigger issue. Okay. So there are four really four subtopics that I will try and overview. As you can imagine, this is a challenging task. Okay. So I will probably uh, try and give you a sense for the work. Uh, you, you may have to go to the posters to, and talk to the students to get a, a more clear picture of the details. Okay. So the first one is a more traditional uh, cognitive radio kind of a scenario which involves spectrum sensing and how do you sense the spectrum in some efficient manner and followed by utilization of the spectrum. Okay. Uh, this is work with that Professor Tarajavidi and, and her student are working on. Then there's work with, uh, that Ramesh Rao and his postdoc, Georgiou, are working on, which has to do with cooperation between networks. And here they use Bayesian networks and game theory to, to make networks cooperate in an e efficient manner. Uh, the third topic is uh, uh, work that my student, Ichao, is doing. And this has to do looking at awareness to, for link-level adaptation and network-level adaptation. Okay. Uh, this portion, I think, I can cover with a little more confidence, okay? Uh, so if I look biased during that coverage, my apologies okay, to my co-PIs. And the last one is uh, certainly, uh, and each hour is in the audience, by the way, so please uh, feel free to talk to him after you see, uh, after I uh, reviewed the material. Uh, then the, the last one is by Professor uh, Massimo, that, who is looking at uh, how to characterize the, the, the channel by looking at EM properties, or propagation properties. Okay. All right, so let me get started. So first topic is the spectrum sensing and utilization. Okay. I think I'll dispense with this sequential. So uh, as you all, if you know Professor Javidi, you know, she has worked in networking, and the topic here she's looking at <coughs> is how to learn about the state of the network and then to dynamically adapt to the network conditions. Okay, so there is, so a component of this is change detection, and then once you detect the change, to act accordingly to, to do dynamic scheduling. Okay. And all these requires, of course, sensing. So data collection and sampling is necessary, but then you need to follow it up with some action. Okay. So the three categories that she's been talking about is samples, sampling where sampling might be expensive. So you're trying to do detection with limited sensing. The other one is samples with noise. This is probably most likely to happen anyway. So you have to use statistical hypothesis testing to, to make decisions okay, and deal with the uncertainty that comes with these noises, noise. And lastly, uh, if the sampling is costly, then you may want to do active sampling. That means figure out how you want to sample and based on the sampling strategy, make decisions. Okay. So the example below is if you're sensing the spectrum, you may choose to decide do you want to sense a collection of, uh, of bands together, or do you want to do fine sensing at a single band level? Okay, so if you sample a single band, maybe you have higher accuracy, but if you sample a broader band, you have more, uh, less information. Okay. So let me try and maybe at a high level describe the work. Uh, uh, so if you think in terms of spectrum sensing, you know, there are, say, N channels, then you need to know the state of the channel. So this would be a model as a Markov chain. So if you have n channels, it could be active. If it's inactive, then you have to talk about the quality of the channel. So depending on that, you can come up with different states, and you have this underlying Markov chain. Okay? And you make observations, and you're trying to infer something about the Markov chain, which state you're in, because that's really the goal in spectrum sensing, to figure out what is the state of occupancy in the network, okay? of the channels. Okay? So when you do this, you have sampling strategies. You sample which part. So based on your prior knowledge, or, or current knowledge, you can make some inferences what state you're likely to be in. Okay? And then based on that knowledge, then you can devise a, a sampling stra a strategy of sensing. How many, what band you want to sense, and what is the bandwidth of, of your sensing. Okay? 
And once you sense that, you can update, of course, your, your inference mechanism. So you can now refine your idea of what state you're in. Okay? And then, depending on that, you can make a decision on how to utilize the resources and do efficient communication. Okay? So the whole problem is really trying to uh, understand what, how to model and how to incorporate sensing into the modeling and then how to efficiently use the result of that to make decisions. Okay? Now, one of the steps that comes out is, of course, ac acquisition cost versus accuracy. Okay, so, and there's always this trade-off because if you spend too much time sensing, you're wasting time. When this channel is empty, you may want to transmit. Okay, so you want to sense as little as possible if you can and then take action, but you may make mistakes. So there's this trade-off, and so you need to analytically characterize this. Okay. In the last slide, I think uh, there is a, was a goal that you want to implement this in real systems. I don't know if she's talking about actually a test bed and implementation, but certainly the plan is to take this theory to some, some practice, okay? So the next topic is the work by Giorgio. Uh, I think he's in the audience, I hope. Okay, yeah, he's there. So, so anything I say, you know, if I make a mistake, I'm sure he can correct me at the end, okay? I spent some time with me, but you know, it's in short-term memory. So I, I may still make a, a mistake to this, okay? But the basic problem is quite simple. Okay, the, at least I can, that is, we can all relate to this. Uh, there are two competing networks uh, who have no desire to share, but realize sharing is a good idea. Okay? So here, networks are D1, D2, indicated by the red nodes and the, and the black nodes. Okay? And you can see if the black nodes are either isolated or the red nodes are isolated, then the black nodes can help them. So the networks can help them, and you want to figure out how to share. Okay? Clearly, if they can share all the nodes, then it's just one effective network, and that's the best strategy. Okay? So that's clearly true, but in this case, the networks are not willing to share, they only want to share a limited amount of resources. Okay? So there are two, uh, two aspects to this. One is to figure out what, what nodes to share, okay? what is the best nodes that, say, the D1 network would wish to share with D2, and similarly, what nodes D2 should share with D1 to make the life of D1 easy. And the second one is to come up with a scheme where you would incentivize these networks to actually share those nodes. Okay. So uh, they address this by using Bayesian networks to first come up with this, this scheme that tells them which are the best nodes to share. Okay. And then a game theoretic approach where they create incent sufficient incentives so that at the end, they actually do what is best interest of both the networks. Okay. So maybe I'll say a few words about the Bayesian network, because that's the part I, I think I understood better. Okay. So simply here, we are trying to figure out you know, which nodes, say, D1 should share with D2, okay, so that the life of D2 is simple. And similarly, we need to know D2 is trying to figure out what node it wishes to share with D1 so that D1 has an easier time. Okay. So what, the, what we do is they construct a Bayesian network, and the Bayesian network has a very simple five network, uh, five variable network. Okay. N captures the neighboring nodes. So for every node in the network, you actually figure out how many neighbors it has, okay? And then the number of flows that go through the network, that's another variable, okay? And then you have three measurements that you make. One, the average delay, which is the zeta. Then probability that the Q will overflow, that means the buffers overflow. And the, last, and the third variable, P of TF, is the probability that the link fails. Okay, I think it's probably LF. This information, by the way, can be obtained fairly easily. If you look at a single node, you can know its neighbors, and you can know all the flows that are going through it, because it knows the entire network topology. Okay? So N and F are observed just simply by looking at the network, okay? without making any measurements. Okay? The remaining three variables you have to actually compute by actually getting flows through the network and measuring delays and things of that kind. Okay? So those are things that you measure. And this is generated by basically creating several random topologies and then making this measurement. So you compute these statistics, and you come up with this joint distribution. Okay? So at the end of this exercise, you have a network that describes this joint distribution. Okay? So D1 has this distribution. D2 has this distribution. Okay? So when a certain topology arises, it uses this particular Bayesian network to draw conclusions as to which node it will share. Okay? In other words, it can try saying, OK, I will share this node and calculate the the, it can calculate N and M directly, and then from there infer the remaining three uh, parameters from which it says, is this good or bad based on the three variables P of LF, P of Q0, and zeta. They translate to network performance metrics. Okay? 
So in other words, this Bayesian network helps these, uh, these networks D1 and D2 to figure out which nodes to share. Okay? And this is done by selecting one node at a time. So if you want to share, say, two nodes, then it figures out which is the best node to share, followed by the second best node to share. Okay? And lastly, then, they come up with a game theory, uh, a, a game wherein these networks actually are incentivized to share. Okay? So this, they, they play a game at the end, the network settles on actually sharing the best nodes. They show that it will share the best nodes. Here's an example, for instance, that uh, I will talk about the left graphs, and the right graph has similar information. This is a, uh, the x-axis of the left graph is simply the, the number of packets being generated. This is the traffic in the network. Okay? So as you go from left to right, higher and higher traffic in the network. Okay? And the vertical line is networks that are received with, with, within a certain delay. Okay? So the top one is 100 slots, and the bottom one is 600 slots. So that means the bottom one has more, is more relaxed which is why you can see that the, the throughput, the, the success is higher at the lower graph than the above one. Okay? But the important one to observe is that full cooperation and the strategy that they developed where they share two nodes have a similar performance. It's the topmost part of the curve. Okay? So they always do better than no cooperation or random cooperation, random nodes being used for cooperation. And they can get similar performance as full cooperation by just developing the, as a two-node cooperation in this particular network. So the main idea here is figuring out how to share and how to develop effective sharing uh, techniques. Okay. Is anybody keeping track of time, or I just do it myself? <laughs> okay, I don't know if five minutes will do, but I will. I will try. <laughs> okay. So this is the work that my student has been doing. Okay, and uh, here again, we uh, our goal is still to figure out how to include. Uh, learning and memory, if possible, into the network, okay? So uh, when we start thinking about cognition or awareness, you know, we want to break them down into what, what are the different types of awareness that's possible. And our focus is often at the, either at the link level or at the network level. So if you're looking at a heterogeneous network, then it's at a network level, or if you're looking at a single level, then it's the channel properties. So we look at the so we divide up this awareness into three types, which is channel state. So what do you know about the channel? Okay. And then user state, that means you need to know who the users are and where they are, and maybe even know something about what they, their preferences are. Okay. And lastly, of course, you need to know the infrastructure. So you need to know what infrastructure is available to you and how, uh, what kind of, uh, of uh, uh, complexity they have. Okay. So we would, would like to adapt the network to these system parameters. When you look at this, though, I must say that you know, awareness is something that's already there in communication systems. It's not that it's not there. Okay? It's a question of how comprehensively you can integrate this awareness into the network. Okay? Are we missing things that we should learn, okay? that we can incorporate? Okay? So uh, our task is really to start seeing if we can do better than what existing networks do. Okay? And when we think about this, we like to, uh, in my mind at least, I don't know my student, but I think in terms of location awareness, because I think next generation systems will probably have location awareness, okay? So if they have location awareness, what does that mean to the overall network, okay? So as an example, for the channel state, if I know where I am, it's possible the system, I, I can know what my path loss will be before I make measurements. Because I, if I know where the access points are and I have this topology, then even before I start communication, I probably know all the path losses. For instance, if I have multiple users and the, and the infrastructure knows where the users are, then it may actually have a, already a pretty decent idea of the interference pattern that it's generating. It doesn't need to really make measurements to make these inferences. Okay? Or another way of looking at it, a more sophisticated way of looking at channels is, often we look at statistical properties of channels. And these channel properties are averaged over the entire cell. Okay? That means they lack the granularity. You know, there may be different points in the cell with completely different statistical properties, and yet when we lump them together, you lose this granularity. Okay? So what you would probably like is a distribution conditioned on position. Okay? So if you're at position X, what is the, the distribution that you're likely to see? Okay? This is very useful because if you're doing, say, MIMO, if you knew the channel distribution properties, that means you knew the correlation across the antennas, you can already do effective beamforming without actually collecting instantaneous channel information. Okay? Or if you have multiple links, you'll never be able to get all the channel information you want. Okay? Some of them you have to guess, and this guess can be done through this channel distribution information. Okay? So we like to combine channel distribution 
and channel, instantaneous channel information to try and devise schemes. And that's really the main, main story here. Okay? Just to give you a sampling of this, okay? Uh, so uh, let's say I want to do resource allocation and we do feedback. This is typical in OFDMA systems. You know. How much feedback do we want, okay? So typically, we will ask for what we call best M feedback. That means you feedback your best possible sub, sub banks, okay? Now, this strategy is too homogeneous, if you think about it, because different locations in the cell have different spectral properties. The coherence bandwidth is not the same, okay? The kind of delay spread you'll see if you're close to the base station is quite different from what you'll see when you're far from the base station, okay? So the coherence bandwidth may be much smaller, okay, when you're far away and much larger when you're close by. So maybe when you do this grouping, you want a different strategy, okay? So this is position aware, okay? So your feedback strategy and your grouping strategy is based on this position, okay? So your feedback, so we do what, what we do here is we say, here's a simple example where there are two different sets of group of users. They have similar channel characteristics, so they are treated differently. Okay, each group is asked to do a different amount of feedback. And then, so you scale this feedback resources according to the channel properties. Okay? And then you, we derive expressions for both the spectral efficiency as well for, and compare it with the homogeneous feedback. Of course, we, uh, we address, uh, there are many imperfections, so my student has looked at uh, incorporating them into, the, uh, into the, the framework, and imperfections are channel estimation error, of course, feedback delay, and then quantization in the feedback, okay? And in all these cases, our goal has been always to ask, if I had full feedback, which is not theoretically possible, but if I had, what I would get, and how do I find the corresponding low feedback system to match the performance? And this work appear, will be appearing soon in, a, in, a, in one of the transactions. Okay. I think in the interest of time, I will try to, I, I think I, have, I could speak forever on this topic, but you know, feel free to talk to my student. Okay, again, same idea here, but in a heterogeneous co context. We have each access point at a different density. How do you use this location awareness at the network level to try and do uh, you know, heterogeneous feedback? So I will skip a few slides here. Uh, I apologize to each of He worked very hard in creating these very colorful slides, but I will, I will pass over them. Okay. So uh, the last topic is the, uh, the work of Massimo. Okay. And here he's looking at the degrees of freedom of multiple scattering environments. Alon is looking at his watch, so I know it is, I'm over a little bit. Okay. So uh, here, again, the idea is that you know, if you're looking from an information theory point of view, the channel the channel tells you about what the throughputs are likely to be. Okay? But in real, reality, uh, you know, the nature provides the channels, so EM theory explains what the channels are going to be. <laughs> so the question is, what does nature tell you as, about the channels, and how realistic, what inference can you draw from nature on the quality of the channels you can in, include in your information theoretic models? Okay? Okay. I notice in Massimo's slides here a lot of questions, and still to be answered. So the good news is I can leave it as saying a lot of open problems, okay? And the problem, I think, uh, as a, at a nutshell, is the following. If I go, say go from one antenna to two antennas, okay, then we, from many of the theory we know, we have two parallel channels, okay? We can talk about it as two, two degrees of freedom, okay? I can go to a wide band, I can, instead of going in space, I can go in, t in frequency. If I double the band, then I have now double the bandwidth, so I can think of it as twice the capacity. The question he's trying to ask is, when does this end? Okay, if I go to eight, will that make it eight times? And if I go to increase the frequency eight times, will all this scale in both in space and time? That's the question, okay? So what are the total number of independent channels? At what point does this scaling things don't work so simply, okay? So the group, his, his group is trying to answer is in a mathematically rigorous way, what are the total number of degrees of freedom required to properly characterize the space frequency scaling limit, okay? And the question is, can it really be done, okay? I will not cover the two slides because uh, at the end, I will show you his last conclusion so you can draw your own inference as to where the state is, okay? At this point, it's, there are challenges with how to scale this system, and so the answer is still unknown, okay? So probably the next review, he will tell you a, a, a potential answers to this question. Okay. Thank you.